from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Lady in White Scotland claims its share of phantoms in the form of white ladies. According to tradition, the ruins of the mansion of Wood Housley were haunted by a woman in white, presumably, though personally I think otherwise, the ghost of Lady Hamilton of Bothwahag. This unfortunate woman, together with her baby, was during the temporary absence of her husband, stripped naked and turned out of doors on a bitterly cold night by a favorite of the Regent Murray. As a result of this inhuman conduct, the child died and its mother with a corpse in her arms was discovered in the morning raving mad. Another instance of this particular form of apparition is said to be found in Sir Walter Scott's White Lady of Avenel, and there are countless others, both in reality and fiction. Some years ago, when putting up at a friend's house in Edinburgh, I was introduced to a man who had several experiences with ghosts, and had therefore been specially asked to meet me. After we had talked together for some time, he related the following adventure which had befallen him in his childhood on the Ronama estate of Sir E. C. near Stirling. I was always a lover of nature and my earliest reminiscences are associated with solitary rambles through the fields, dells, and copses surrounding my home. I lived within a stone's throw of the property of old Sir E. C. who has long gone to rest. God bless his soul, and I think it needs blessing. For if there was any truth in local gossip, and it is said, I think truly, that there is never any smoke without fire, he had lived a very queer life. Indeed, he was held in such universal awe and abhorrence that we children used to fly at his approach and never spoke of him among ourselves, saving in such terms as Old Dower Crab or the Lairdale. Ronan Manor House, where he lived, was a fine specimen of 16th century architecture and had it been called a castle would have merited the description far more than many of the buildings in Scotland that bear that name. It was approached by a long avenue of trees, gigantic elms, oaks, and beeches, which, uniting their branches overhead in summertime, formed an effective barrier to the sun's rays. This avenue had an irresistible attraction for me. It swarmed with rabbits and squirrels, and many other times I trespassed there to watch them. I had a very secure hiding place in the hollow in old oak, where I was often secreted while Sir E. C. and his keepers without casting a glance in my direction, passed unsuspectingly by, vowing all sorts of vengeance against trespassers. Of course, I had to be very careful how I got there, for the grounds were well patrolled and Sir E. C. had sworn to prosecute anyone he caught walking in them without his permission. Had he caught me, I should doubtless have been treated with the utmost severity, since he and my father were the most bitter opponents politically, and for that reason, unreasonable though it may be, never lost an opportunity of insulting one another. My father, a strong radical, was opposed to all big landed proprietors and consequently winked his eye at my trespassings. But I think nothing would really have pleased him better than to have seen me brought to book by Sir E. C., since in my defense he would have had an opportunity of appealing to the passions of the local people who were all radicals, and of incensing them still further against the principles of feudalism. I had often heard it rumored in the village that Ronham Avenue was haunted, and that the apparition was a lady in white, actually Sir E.C.'s wife, whose death at a very early age was said to have been hastened, if not entirely accounted for, by her husband's harsh treatment. Whether he was really as black as he was painted, I have never been able to ascertain. The intense animosity with which we all regarded him made us believe anything ill of him, 
and we were quite ready to attribute all the alleged hauntings in the neighborhood to his past misdeeds. I think my family, with scarcely an exception, believed in ghosts. Anyhow, the subject of ghosts was so often discussed in my hearing that I became possessed of an ungovernable curiosity to see one. If only the lady in white would appear in the daytime, I thought, I should have no difficulty in satisfying this curiosity. But unfortunately, she did not appear till night, long after boys of my age had been ordered off to bed. I did not much like the idea of stealing out of the house at dead of night and going alone to see the ghost, so I suggested to a school friend that he should also creep out one night and accompany me to Ronham to look for the lady. But the risk of being caught trespassing was too much for him, and so I made up my mind to go to Ronham Avenue alone. Biding my opportunity and waiting till my father was safely out of the way, on a visit to Greenock, where a business transaction would oblige him to remain for some days, I climbed out of my bedroom window one night when I judged the rest of the household to be sound asleep, scudded swiftly across the fields and making short work of the lofty wall that formed the southernmost boundary of the Ronan estate, quickly made my way to the avenue. It was an ideal Sunday night in August, hardly a sound breaking the exquisite silence of the woods. At times, overcome with a delightful sensation of freedom, I paused and raising my eyes to the starry heavens drank in huge draughts of the pure country air. I then performed the maddest boyish capers, but finally sobering down continued on my course. Every now and then fancying I detected the footsteps of a keeper, I hid behind a tree. But it was only fancy, for I saw no one. It must have been fully one o'clock before I arrived at the outskirts of the avenue, and advancing eagerly settled myself in my favorite sanctuary, the hollow oak. All was hushed and motionless, and as I gazed into the gloom, I became conscious, for the first time in my life, of a sensation of eeriness. Not a glimmer of moonlight penetrated the arched canopy of foliage overhead. The loneliness got on my nerves. At first, I grew afraid, only afraid, and then my fears turned into a panic to get away from the grim spot. I emerged from my retreat and was preparing to fly through the wood or from afar, there suddenly came the sound of a voice, the harsh, grating voice of a man. Convinced this time that I had been discovered by a keeper, I jumped back into the tree and, swarming up the inside of the trunk, peered cautiously out. What I saw then nearly made me jump out of my skin. Advancing along the avenue was the thing I had always longed to see, and for which I had risked so much, the mysterious, far-famed lady in white, a ghost, an actual bona fide ghost. I thrilled with excitement and my heart thumped till it seemed on the verge of bursting through my ribs. The lady in white. Why? It would be the talk of the whole countryside. Someone had really no hearsay evidence seeing the notorious apparition at last. I looked at her closely and saw that she was entirely luminous, emitting a strong glow. She wore a quantity a white drapery swathed around her in a manner that perplexed me until I suddenly realized with a creeping of my flesh that it must be a winding sheet, that burial accessory so often minutely described to me by the son of the village undertaker. Streaming over her neck and shoulders were thick masses of long wavy golden hair. Her face, despite its pallor, was so beautiful that had not some restraining influence compelled me to remain in hiding I would have descended from my perch to obtain a closer view of it. I only once caught a glimpse of her full face, for with a persistence that was most annoying, she kept it turned from me. But in that brief second, the luster of her blue eyes won my very soul. Those eyes are still firmly impressed on my memory. I shall never forget them. Nothing I thought, either on earth or in heaven, could have been half so lovely. And I was so moved that it was not until she was directly beneath me that I saw she was not alone, and that walking by her side with one arm around her waist, his face and figure illuminated with a light from her body, was Sir E.C., but how changed. Gone was the deep black scowl, the grim tightening of the jaws, and the intensely disagreeable expression that had earned him the nickname of the Laird Dell. And in their stead I saw love, 
nothing but blind, infatuated, soul-devouring love. Even as a child, I could recognize the strong emotion. Throwing discretion to the wind, for my excitement and curiosity had risen to the highest pitch, I now thrust more than half my body out of the hole in the trunk. The next instant, with a loud cry, I pitched head first to the ground. I don't know how long I lay there, stunned but otherwise unhurt except for cuts and bruises. On coming to, I fully expected to find myself in the hands of the irate laird, who would seize me by the scruff of the neck and belabor me to pieces. Consequently, too frightened to move, I lay still with my eyes closed. But when nothing happened, I picked myself up. All was quiet and pitch dark, with no sign of the lady in white or of Sir E.C. It did not take me very long to get out of the wood and home. I ran all the way, and as it was still far too early for any of the household to be astir, I was able to creep up to my bedroom unobserved, but not to sleep. For the moment, I blew up the candle and got into bed. Reaction set in and I suffered agonies of fear. In the morning, however, my fears had subsided and I went to school, bubbling over with excitement to tell the boys what had happened. But I then received another shock. Before I could get out a word of my experiences, I was told with a roar and shout that the old Laird Dell was dead. His body had been found stretched on the ground in the avenue shortly after sunrise. He had died from syncope, so the doctor said, probably caused by some severe shock. I did not tell my companions of my night's adventure after all. My eagerness to do so had departed when I heard of the old Laird's death. From the cellar it came. The wealthy Lady Adela Minken, whose yacht at Cowes was the envy of all who cruised in her, was the owner of a considerable amount of house property, much of which, as she freely admitted to me, she had not set eyes on nor had any special desire to do so, having very competent agents to handle her affairs. However, when curious reports kept filtering through to her about an alleged haunting in one of the houses in Edinburgh, she became intrigued and decided to put the haunting to the test. Lady Adela was a perfectly frank and open-minded woman. Though she had never experienced any occult phenomenon herself, she was not inclined to dismiss as so much rubbish the evidence of those tenants who declared they had witnessed manifestations. Accordingly, she proceeded with her test in very practical fashion, commencing her occupation of the house in F Road with a perfectly unbiased mind and resolving to stay there if needs be for at least a year so as to give it a fair trial. Lady Adela took up residence in the house in the early summer of 1908, having been told that the hauntings were generally at their height in the late summer and early autumn. It is, I think, unnecessary to enter into any detailed description of the house. In appearance, it differed very little, if at all, from those adjoining it. In construction, it was, if anything, a trifle large. The basement, which included the usual kitchen offices and cellars, was very dark, and to her great puzzlement, Lady Adela found that the atmosphere hereafter sunset on Fridays, and only on Fridays, was tainted with a strong smell of damp earth, together with a sweet and nauseating something she and the servants were totally unable to account for. All the rooms in the house were of fair dimensions and cheerful except on Friday evenings, when a distinct gloom settled on them and the strangest of shadows were seen playing about the passage and on the landing. Now, as I have said, Lady Adela was a thoroughly practical woman, and so she inclined to put down these Friday feelings to mere fancy, and anyway, she told herself, if all she encountered was nothing worse than a weekly menu of smells and eagerly digested shadows, she was not likely to suffer any harm. But as the weeks went by, The shadows and the smell grew more and more pronounced, and by the arrival of August had become so emphatic that she could not help thinking they were both hostile and aggressive. At about eight o'clock on the evening of the second Friday in August, Lady Adela was purposely alone in the basement of the house. She had felt that the presence of the servants in the house minimized her chances of seeing the ghost, if ghost it was, and so she sent them all out for motor drive and for once unconventionally rejoiced in having the house to herself. She was not, however, entirely alone, for she had two of her dogs with her, two beautiful boarhounds, trophies of her last trip to the Baltic. With such faithful companions, she felt absolutely safe and ready, 
as she acknowledged afterwards to face a whole army of phantoms. First she made a tour of the premises. The housekeeper's room pleased her immensely. At least she persuaded herself it did. Why, it is quite as nice as any of the rooms upstairs, she said aloud as she stood with her face to the falling sunbeams and rested her strong white hand on the edge of the table. Quite as nice. Carl and Max, come here. But the boar hounds for once did not obey her with good grace. There was something in the room they did not like, and they showed how strong was their resentment by slinking unwillingly through the doorway. Lady Adela scolded them lightly. Then her eyes wandered around the walls and struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the room, which had suddenly grown dark. She tried to assure herself that this was simply the natural effect of departing daylight, and that, had she watched in other houses at this particular time, she would have noticed the same thing, to show herself and the dogs. How little she minded the gloom, she went up to the darkest corner and prodded the walls with a writing whip. She laughed. There was nothing there. Nothing whatsoever to be afraid of, only shadows. She then walked out into the passage, and whistling to Carl and Max, who contrary to their custom would not keep to heel, made another inspection of the kitchens. At the top of the cellar steps she stopped. The darkness had now set in everywhere, and she reasoned with herself that it would be foolish to venture into such dungeon-like places without a light. She soon found one, and armed with candle matches and the whip, began her descent. There were several cellars, and they presented such a dismal appearance that she instinctively drew her skirts tightly around her and exchanged the slender riding whip for a poker. She whistled again to the dogs. They did not answer, so she called them both by name angrily, but for some unaccountable reason they still would not come. Lady Adela ransacked her mind to recall some popular operatic air. But although she knew scores, she could not remember one. The only melody that filtered back to her was one she detested, a vaudeville tune. She had heard three nights in succession when staying with a student friend in the Latin Quarter in Paris. She hummed it loudly, however, and holding the lighted candle high above her head, walked down the steps. At the bottom, she stood and listened. From high above came noises, which sounded like the rumbling of distant thunder but which she determined after a few moments was only the rattling of the windows. Reassured that she had no cause for alarm, Lady Adele advanced. Something black scudded across the red-tiled floor, and she made a dash at it with her poker. The sharp noise of the poker striking the floor awoke countless echoes in the cellars and called into existence legions of other black things that darted hither and thither in all directions. She burst out laughing. They were only beetles. Facing her, she now saw in an inner cellar, which was far gloomier than the one in which she stood. The ceiling was very low and appeared to be crushed down beneath the burden of a stupendous weight. And as she advanced beneath it, she half expected that it would cave in and bury her. A few feet from the center of the cellar, she stopped and bending down, examined the floor carefully. The tiles were unmistakably newer here than anywhere else and presented the appearance of having been put in at no distant date. The dampness of the atmosphere was intense, a fact which struck her as somewhat odd, since the floor and the walls looked singularly dry. To find out if this were the case, she ran her finger over the walls, and on removing them, found they showed no signs of moisture. Then she wrapped the floors and walls, and could discover no indications of hollowness. She sniffed the air, and a great wave of something sweet and sickly half choked her. She drew out her handkerchief and beat the air vigorously with it, but the smell remained and she could not in any way account for it. She turned to leave the cellar and the flame of her candle burned blue. Then for the first time that evening, almost indeed for the first time in her life, she felt afraid. So afraid that she made no attempt to reason her fear. She understood the dog's feelings now and found herself wondering how much they knew. She whistled to them again, not because she had any confidence they would respond, but because she wanted company, even the company of her own voice. And she had some faint hope, too, that whatever might be with her in the cellar would not so readily disclose itself if she made a noise. The one cellar was passed, and she was nearly across the floor of the other when she heard a crash. 
The candle dropped from her hand and all the blood in her body seemed to rush to her heart. As she told me, I could never have imagined it was so terrible to be frightened. I tried to pull myself together and be calm, but I was no longer mistress of my limbs. My knees knocked together and my hands shook. It was only the dogs. I feebly told myself, I will call them. But when I opened my mouth, I found my throat was paralyzed. Not a syllable would come. She knew full well, too, that the hounds could not have been responsible for the noise. It was like nothing she had ever heard, nothing that she could imagine. And though she struggled hard against the idea, she could not help associating the sound with the cause of the candle burning blue and the sweet, sickly smell. Incapable of moving a step, she was forced to listen in breathless expectancy for a recurrence of the crash. Her thoughts became ghastly. The inky darkness that hemmed her in on every side suggested every sort of ghoulish possibility. And with each pulsation of her overstrained heart, her flesh crawled. Another sound, this time not a crash. Nothing half so loud or definite drew her eyes in the direction of the steps. An object was now standing at the top of them, and something lurid like the faint phosphorescent glow of decay emanated from all over it. But what it was, she could not tell, except that it was inexpressibly antagonistic and foul. I would have given my soul to have looked elsewhere, but my eyes were fixed. I could neither turn nor shut them. For some seconds, the shape remained motionless, and then with a sly, subtle motion, it lowered its head and came stealing stealthily down the stairs towards me. I followed its approach like one in a horrible dream. Another step, another, yet another, till there were only three steps left between us and I was at last able to form some idea of what the thing was like. It was short and squat and appeared to be partly clad in a loose flowing garment, which was not long enough to conceal the glistening extremities of its limbs. From its general contour, and the tangled mass of hair that fell about its neck and shoulders, it seemed to be the phantasm of a woman. Its head being kept bent, I was unable to see the face in full, but every instant I expected to have sight of it, and with each separate movement, the figure of the suspense became more and more intolerable. At last it stood on the floor of the cellar, a broad, horribly ungainly figure, which glided up to and thankfully passed me into the far cellar. There it halted, as nearly as I could judge on the new tiles, and remained standing. As I gazed at it, too fascinated to remove my eyes, there was a loud echoing crash, a terrible sound of wrenching and tearing, and the whole of the ceiling of the inner chamber came down with an appalling roar. I think I must have then fainted, for I distinctly remember falling into what seemed to me to be a black, interminable abyss. When I recovered consciousness, I was lying on the tiles, and all around was still and normal. I got up, found and lighted the candle, and spent the rest of the evening without further adventure in the drawing room. All the following week, Lady Adela struggled hard to master a disinclination to spend another evening alone in the house. But when Friday came again, she succumbed to her fears and kept the servants at home. She sat reading in the drawing room till late that night, and when she looked out of the window to take a farewell glance at the sky and stairs before retiring to bed, the sounds of traffic had completely ceased and the whole city lay bathed in a refreshing silence. She put the lights out and got into bed. It was just one o'clock when she fell asleep and three o'clock when she awoke with a violent start. Why she had woken puzzled her. She had not been dreaming and there seemed nothing to account for her sudden wakefulness she lay still her tired eyes closed again and wondered surely everything was just as it was when she went to sleep and yet there was something different something new she did not think it was actually in the atmosphere nor in the silence she did not know where it was until she opened her eyes again and then she knew bending over her within a few inches of her face was another face. It was on a larger scale than that of any person I have ever seen. It was long in proportion to its width. I could not make out where the cranium terminated at the back. 
as the hind portion of it was lost in a mist. The receding forehead was partly covered with a mass of lank black hair that fell straight down into space. There was no neck, nor shoulders, at least none had materialized. The skin was leaden-hued and the emaciation so extreme that the raw cheekbones had burst through in places. The size of the eye sockets, which appeared monstrous, were emphasized by the fact that the eyes were considerably sunken. The lips were curled downwards and tightly shut, and the whole expression of the withered mouth, as that of the entire face, was one of bestial malignity. I was petrified. As I stared helplessly at the dark eyes pressed close to mine, I saw them light up with fiendish glee. The most frightful change then took place. The upper lip writhed away from a few greenish-yellow stumps. The lower jaw fell with a metallic click, leaving the mouth widely open and showing a black and bloated tongue. And the eyeballs rolled up and entirely disappeared, their places being immediately filled with the most loathsome sign of advanced decay. A strong vibratory movement suddenly made all the bones in the head rattle and the tongue wag while from the jaws as it belched up from some deep down well came a gust of putrescent wind tainted with the same squeakly sour odor which I recognized from the cellar. This was the culminating act. The head then receded and growing fainter and fainter gradually disappeared altogether. I leaped out of bed, put on all the lights and did not dare close my eyes again until the birds had begun their dawn chorus. Lady Della was now more than satisfied that there was not a house more horribly haunted in Scotland, and nothing would induce her to remain in it another night. Being anxious naturally to discover something that might in some degree account for the apparitions, she made endless inquiries concerning the history of former occupants of the house. Failing to discover anything remarkable in this direction, she was eventually obliged to content herself with the following tradition. It is said that on the side of the house there had once stood a cottage occupied by two sisters, both nurses, and that one was suspected of poisoning the other. The cottage, having through their parsimonious habits fallen into a very bad state of repair, was blown down during a violent storm, the surviving sister perishing in the ruins. Lady Adela, after being assured that only about one in a thousand people seemed to possess the faculty of seeing psychic phenomena, decided to offer the house for rent again, and once the rumors had begun to fade away, she succeeded eventually in getting a permanent tenant. Apparently, and most fortunately this time, one of the 999.